Blog Talk Radio.
Jerry Russell Jr. So the, the thing is, I don't know. Now he's saying, I'll go up to 147. It's like, dude, I'm all for you in the last, especially the last year to two years, but especially like the last year. I'm all for you voicing your opinion a lot more than you used to. I, I am all for that. Um, but let's not forget that you were okay with fighting once a year. And I've already gone down that path a couple of times so far this year, uh, especially one time when I kind of had a rant on him. Uh, because like I said, you know, I get it. A closed mouth don't get fed. I, I get all that stuff. But he acts like Mayweather was ducking him too. You know what I mean? Like, it, it just, I go back to saying he got ducked by, by, by all these guys and calling out Santa Cruz when Santa Cruz is fighting Tank. And, you know, there's just a lot that, that goes into it. But like I said, I am glad that he is looking like he wants to fight twice a year now. Look, he's probably getting to that part of his career where he's like, you know what? I need to make, you know, my legacy of some sorts uh, rather than what it is right now. We'll also talk about Paulie Malignaggi getting fired from Showtime um, for some ignorant statements. I actually covered this probably about a month ago or something like that. Uh, someone sent me – I saw on Twitter people talking about it, and uh, either someone sent me it or I, I located the video he was talking um, about Devin. It started with the, the Devin Haney comment. The white boy comments, and I already addressed that too. He never get beat by a white boy, although he did twice in the amateurs. But um, as far as Paulie, I, I, we're going to talk about it because I notice a lot of people are concentrating, and whether they're just ignorant or racist or whatever, um, or they're you know, freedom of speech is a great thing, but when you work for a large corporation, it's limited. So you can fight the good fight against that if you want. I get that part. But don't make it into something bigger than it is when it's some of it's just common sense. But, yeah, a lot of people are, are stuck on his Eastern European. Um, everyone's going to get beat by Eastern European or, you know, they took over the sport and all that. But they're not looking at what he said about, you know, racial oppression and how he just downplayed. I mean, he we're, we're going to get it. He's talking about some ignorant shit, and, and this is what happens when you work for a conglomerate. Uh, I know, like I said, I, I know a lot of people. I, I understand the freedom of speech thing. I do get that part. But the, the, the thing that people are focused on is the Eastern European thing. And, I mean, this isn't the first ignorant stuff he said, and I'm not saying that, his thoughts on the Eastern European I'm not saying that's like racist or, or even ignorant, really. Um, I guess, you know, we'll find out if the Eastern Europeans are actually going to take the sport over. It's been said for about five years now, and they haven't taken it all over, but they have. I mean, the, you know, the Ukrainian team, the Uzbek, you know, Uzbekistan team, they got the Uzbekis are coming up, dude. But, you know, let's just keep it all in reference. But, yeah, a lot of people – for whatever reason, are focused on the wrong parts of what he said that got him fired. And to me, that's pretty telling. To me, that's kind of like, oh, okay, so you're just going to ignore that other shit? Well, that's his opinion. Yeah, it's an opinion, you know, when he covers a lot of black fighters. And speaking of oppression, in this country, Hispanic and black fighters, he covers a lot of them. Or he broadcast, it's maybe not cover is the right way. Well, he kind of did on his podcast, but so there's, there's, there's all you can, you can, you know, switch it up and you can ignore certain things, but you're not, you have to at least look at it from an open eye and not sit there and say, oh, this is bullshit because of that. Well, hold on now. Let, let's really look at it, okay? Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about that. Um, and just a variety of other things. Um, Oscar De La Hoya talking about Garcia Campbell, you know, on <laughs> social media is just so on brand. You got like Ryan Garcia saying, 
basically the fight's done and talking about the fight, and then him coming out later going, no, it's not. And, 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 and the, There's just certain things. Like, I understand social media, you're going to use it, right? I get that part. But there's just shit that you're like, Oscar, what, what are you doing, dude? Can you make fights? Like, what is going on with your company right now? And I know it's not just him. I'm sure he was talking to Eddie or, or maybe he was actually talking to Garcia. I don't know. He says so many things out of the side of his mouth, even about Ryan Garcia. And there's some things that make me scratch my head sometimes about Garcia when he says something. But in the end, like, he's a young dude. And I'm not saying he's got to run you over or anything like that, but it's like, why don't you just be smart and handle business not on Twitter, you know? Because Garcia will go on an interview and be like, yeah, dude, I, I've tried to text people. I've tried to talk to people. They don't talk to me. Then they'll just tweet. And it's like, wow, dude, you guys are that hung up on everything. But anyway, um, if this, this is your first time listening to the Rope It Up Radio podcast, welcome. It streams live right here on blogtalkradio.com forward slash Rope It Up Radio. Not trying to do these afternoon shows throwing people off that for the people that like to listen live or text me live during the show and whatnot. It just it fits in my schedule, basically, is, is what's going on. i, I got to work later tonight. So, uh, But anyway, uh, you don't have to just go to blogtalkradio.com and, and, and download it or listen to it there. You can find the, the platform on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Player FM, um, Stitcher, pretty much all across the board. We're also part of the Grueling Truth Sports Podcast Network, which can be found everywhere, including Spotify, can use your Siri or Alexa through Spotify or tune in to find the platform, among others. While you're at it, why don't you head on over to thegruelingtruth.com. That's thegruelingtruth.com. Um, it's football. It's, it's boxing. It's basketball. It's baseball. It's everything in between. And one more thing before we get into some of this recap from a weekend that kind of felt like boxing is back um, to an extent, obviously. Um, it just had that feel. I love the Tuesdays and Thursday schedule during the summer. I wish there'd be more Thursday boxing in general in the summer. Um, I think you could still get a crowd there on a Thursday night because a lot of people go out Thursday night before Friday, especially in the summer. But anyway, um, if you're thinking about cutting the cord, I got something for you. Or you cut the cord and you're not happy. I got something for you. It's called at and TV Now. It's live streaming cable. Um, They have a seven-day free trial. There's no annual contract. The plans start as low as $55 a month. You can stream it anywhere. They have the cloud DVR. And for boxing fans, Showtime is only $11 on the platform. It's called AT&T TV now, like I said, live streaming cable. If you're in a place where your Internet is just super, super garbage, I can relate. I live really close to an airport not long ago, and my Internet still – it's pretty good. It's better now, but not like it used to be. They do have AT&T TV, which is just a normal click cable platform. It's a growing platform, though. It's not available everywhere. It's here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in New York, parts of Florida, parts of Texas, uh, parts of California, all the way up to Seattle in the Northwest, other places like St. Louis in the Midwest. Basically, just Google it, put your area code in there, see if you got it in your area. Otherwise, AT&T TV now, like I said, live streaming cable. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what happened last week. And like I said, in many ways, I appreciated it and enjoyed the Tuesday, Thursday ESPN stuff. You know what I mean? I I did because I'm a hardcore boxing fan, right? I know a lot of people went over the top in their criticism without really looking at the realistic, uh, you know, things they were having to deal with. Now, that is part of going first especially early first, right? I mean, it is what it is. Now, obviously, Showtime and, and some other BT Sports and, and of course, um, DAZN, Sky Sports, they've learned a couple of things uh, from, you know, top rank going first. But the reason why it felt like boxing is back, like close to normal anyway, is just because of the multiple cards and the fact that, took place on a Saturday night. Well, actually, a Saturday during the day with Eggington and Cheeseman and and some other fights on there from the U.K., from Eddie's backyard. (laughs) But um, it just felt 
like, oh, wow, I can watch some fights before I go to work, come back and have something to look forward to. I remember parking my car after I got done closing the bar, and I was just like, oh, that's right, dude. It's Saturday night. There's fights to watch. You know, so the fact – I really think it, it was because of Saturday. The day Saturday, obviously, that's been, you know, for quite some time now, especially in the 2000s anyway, um, the last 15 years, Friday and Saturdays. Of course, you know, everyone – well, not everyone, but a lot of people remember Tuesday night fights on USA and even Wednesdays on Friday night fight or well, Friday night fights. ESPN Wednesday, Friday night fights, I guess you could say. Remember they used to do that like – Late spring, early, or probably early summer, but I know for sure in the summer. But um, it just felt good. It was like, oh, dude, I got shit to watch. And some of these fights are, are interesting, some 50-50 matchups. So, um, now, obviously, um, the main event switched up, you know, and this is something that uh, we're going to have to deal with. I remember – some old hater of uh, mine messaged me saying, oh, you know, the reason why you shouldn't get so excited about those Showtime fights because half of them are going to get canceled. And it's like, all right, dude, well, that's with anything. I mean, I'm excited for football, but does that mean the shit's going to happen or cancel during the season or, you know what I mean? I mean, the MLB, now two separate teams are having issues. Um, so, I, you know, but then you have uh, the NHL and the NBA who now – don't have, you know, the NBA, I think it's been three weeks since they had a, a, a positive, so a test. So I, I'm still going to get excited for a fight that's officially announced. And you know what? If negotiations are close to a deal on some of these fights that we feel like are going to finish, I may start getting excited for those to an extent. You know, I don't hold my breath over some stuff. Like the Teofimo Lopez, uh, Lopez and Lomachenko fight. I'm not holding my breath until that thing's signed, but I cannot wait till that fight happens, if it happens this year. But um, So that's just nonsense. I, I'm not going to – like, I understand in the back of your head you have this well COVID testing, you know. It's going to happen. And that's just part of it. So I, I don't really look at that as something like I can't like fight because of that. This person is just anti-PTC is what it breaks down to. And I saw some other folks say that too, like, don't get – see. You guys are so excited, but look at their first events fucked. And it's like, well, first of all, it's not totally fucked because by waiting, they actually are more prepared. Not that I think top rank in June should have been more prepared because you couldn't even fly people on a special visa to get into the country at that time, whether it's sparring or opponent. You know what I mean? And let's be honest, you know, there's pros and cons to having a lot of fighters. You know, we hear a bunch of the cons from Heyman having a bunch of fighters, right? Because you can't focus on each and every one of them, although he kind of does. But either way, because everybody's at different levels, but it allows him to thrive in a time like this because he has opponents. And look at the 122 division just here in America, which is kind of crazy to have that Amer- many American you know, 122 pounders. That that was kind of interesting how they broke down that list in general, um, whether it was the champs or the American 122s. But they got 122 locked and loaded, and they're going to mix and match like they have at 147, like they have at 154. I think it's kind of in the stages of 168, but they have more talent. Not maybe – I don't know the levels, right, comparatively to 168, but they have just more bodies, let's put it that way. And speaking of more bodies, pause, um, they have built into the schedules, they literally have backups ready to go, whether they're in the co-feature or on the card, or not just sitting home at their couch either. The way it's been explained, the way I've heard, uh, even from Tim Smith the other day, I listened to Boxing Esquire, um, you know, they literally have backup guys ready to go, not off their couch, like I said. They're, they're being paid. You're helping them out with sparring. They're ready to go. You know, and Williams knew that he could go in the main event as a fill-in. He already knew that, but he was already fighting anyway in a 12-round fight. So kudos to Showtime and PBC 
for layering their cards. Now, I'm not saying they got a layer for everything announced, but it, they made it sound like that's what they're trying to do. If not, they have it ready. I, I don't know. I don't know how far they got backups for, until October. And after the I, – I don't really know that. I don't know the facts. Um, or they've already – you know, that was part of making the whole thing. Maybe they make the fights and then get the backups. I don't know. But it sure helps so the whole – card doesn't get messed up what was it like six out of the last nine or six out of the last ten or something like that some kind of crazy number seven on the last ten something like that um for top ranked main events now they did their best to try to you know do what they could um and like i said i'm not really faulting them because it was harder to do that then but it does help when you have such a big stable so I think that's one of the coolest things just off top as a boxing fan watching this stuff and going, oh, man, there goes that main event. Oh, that sucks. You know what I mean? And at least you can have somewhat fill-ins. Now, I think the main event fill-in was better than the rematch fill-in once you got into it a, a couple of rounds with Bates, you know what I mean, But uh, with against Reese. But, um, but anyway, I think that's a great, great, great idea to have backups just ready to go i mean sorry but i think that's dope dude and anybody that thinks that that makes me just pro pbc and anti everything i don't know what to tell you man um but you know it is what it is um actually okay so something's up with the switchboard i'm getting a couple of texts you should be able to call in though maybe if you've hit one every Every blue moon, once in a while, maybe twice a year or something, this used to happen way back in the day when you press one and it would hang you up. I don't think that's a problem right now, but I am having a little switchboard issue, so you can text me uh, for those who kind of regularly listen to it live if you want, if you, if you have any questions. But it should um, should be, you know, should be okay. Uh, but, yeah, just don't press one maybe. I don't know. But, you know, I don't think that's the case, actually, because I – I'm – okay, I just refreshed the switchboard, and I see some some folks on there, and they didn't get knocked off, um, and two of them pressed one. So maybe maybe it's happening now, though. I shouldn't say that. So don't press one. Just, uh, just text me, and I'll let you in if you want. But a lot of people like to just hang out and just just lay back and listen. But anyway, let's get to some of this action here. Uh, Joe George and Marcus, uh, what was it, Escudero? Um, Escudero was pretty much um, dominating this fight. Um, I'm looking at the first chunk of rounds on my scorecard. Uh, I gave, yeah, I mean, I gave him the first – Probably five out of the first six rounds. Um, George did land some nice right hands. Uh, follow, you know, that followed his jab in a lead left hook, and some like late shoe shine stuff in the third. But other than that, uh, Escudero was just, in a lot of ways, just busier, uh, outworking him, landing a bunch of hooks to the body and head, especially the left hook, um, deep into that body body at times right around the elbow um but there that's not to say that there weren't some close rounds the first round was very close could have went either way um I also think that about the fourth round so uh, it just George kept getting put on the ropes which is something we've seen from him in you know the first fight and other fights that I've watched from him and he was just getting out worked and out hustled basically you know, maybe George would have a decent ending to a round or start good or, or whatnot, but it took him a while to get going. And, and, and like I said, I gave him the third, although the first and fourth were, were close. Uh, the eighth was a very close round. I did give that one to George. Uh, George landed this right hand, uh, like, on his forehead, and it probably should have been a knockdown uh, if you look at it. it. To me, it looked like it was a knockdown. Um but I had, you know, Escudero way up, you know. I had him up 6-2 to two going in to the ninth round. And then this sneaky uh, short uppercut on the inside landed. 
And it was a wrap. He was out. And and this is another example. I saw a couple of people say this on Twitter, too. Like, what are you doing counting? Like, you could know. You didn't have to count right away, but I can see the instinct of just counting to to make sure. I mean, look at Tyson Fury. He looked like he was out. We've seen some other guys look like they were kind of out. Um, I remember Daniel Jacobs, when he got knocked out, he was on the ground kind of still. And he wasn't showing anything, so the, so they called it. Then he was like, oh, no, I'm good, I'm good. It's like, well, dude, you got to show some life there. You can't just be still on the ground, you know what I mean, even if you had your eyes open. And uh, once you got to, like, two and three and four and that, just stop the count, dude. There was really no point to that. Um, so it's a, rough, a really rough one for Escudero, man. Really rough. And his corner – was saying, hey, dude, you know, don't lean uh, forward. You know, you only got two rounds. Don't be dumb, basically. And don't do any, you know, mistakes are going to cost you right now. And sure enough, George, who was just trying to land mostly big shots, the jab, the right hand, some lead left hooks, um, when he throws and lands, it's powerful, right? He's got good hand speed or whatever, but he just wasn't doing enough. And like I said, Marcos Escudero was just running the fight. So that that is rough. I mean, he, he was, you know, out working to the body 45 to 28. I'm looking at the copy box. Power shots 113 to 69. Outlanded him 127 to 89 without working him majorly. 599 to 300 punches. I mean, he had it in the bag, kind of like his trainer was saying a little bit anyway. And Sure enough, he didn't, and that sometimes happens in boxing. So, um, I don't know. It's one of those things where, you you know, he got on Sports Center, top ten plays of the day and stuff like that. But Joe George, in this rematch, you know, he he uh, he just didn't perform that well. And you wonder if this stuff's going to add up. But what was that, his 11th or 12th fight? Something like that. Let me look, actually. I think it was 10 and 0. Yeah, they're both no. 10 and 1 and 10 and 0. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but we'll see where he goes. You know, I, I'm a, from my understanding, he's actually a 168 pounder, um, which, you know, would bode well for him because it's not like, well, the PBC has Pascal and still Body Jack and some other folks. But actually, I heard Body Jack is fighting on the undercard of uh, the. Uh, the senior store, uh, the Tyson Roy Jones uh, fight. That's uh, I'm pretty sure I heard that correctly. It, it, you know, I learned more about that app, and it's like not not necessarily just about the app, but about his involvement. And he lit- they they literally want to do like a seniors. I don't know, dude. Like a seniors tour. It's cool if it's golf or something, but this isn't golf, dude. Unless golfers hit each other with their you know, with their irons and, and stuff like that, with their clubs. But this isn't golf. I mean, you need headgear, 16-ounce, 18-ounce gloves. Like, if you're going to do a senior tour, I don't know. Just remember, an exhibition exhibits your skill. That's what it's there for. It's not a real fight. But anyway, let's move on. And obviously, this was the replacement fight. Marcus Bates came in. And we say short notice, but he knew that he, this is his one opportunity on the on the card. So it is a change, but I wouldn't really call it short notice because he was ready. He looked like he was in good shape. And actually, even though he didn't win a bunch of rounds at all, like barely any, the first handful of rounds, these guys were landing in exchanges. And you could see the hand speed. There was a couple of exchanges even in the first round. Both, like I said, looking fast, looking sharp, looking for a knockdown is what it looked like to me. Um, But, you know, Aleem, he just looked really good, dude, defensively. He had the lead left crosses, lead right hands, a beautiful, meaningful jab going the whole time, Um, working the body at times. I probably would have liked to have seen – a little more early, but then he really poured on that body work as it was going around, cutting the ring off. Like I said, landing the the, head, the the harder shots. He was just better overall. 
You know what I mean? It was a one-sided fight, um, especially when you get past, like I said, the third or fourth round. I think he stunned him in the second round, stunned him a couple of times. Uh, just flush shots, though. But, I mean, he, he dominated him. It was over. Uh, TKO, um, there was, you know, it looked like, you know, we all know, besides Leo Santa Cruz, when a fighter shakes his hand, because you know how Leo will shake his, his uh, right hand, and it's, it's kind of like he's saying, it's like calibrating it to make sure I straighten it out when I throw it. It's not, a lot of people give him shit for that, but it's not like Santa Cruz shakes his hand and then immediately throws his punch. So it's not like a tell at all, actually, if you watch uh, his fights and pay attention to that a little bit more. But you could tell he hurt his hand, but it almost looked like he hurt his wrist or elbow, too. Like, it got worse because when he got punched on, that area, whether it's his wrist or hand or whatever, that's actually when he walked away and was like, I'm good. And, and uh, Reese actually, um, right, he's, uh, Aleem actually threw like a left hook. At, like, all right, dude, if you're going to walk away from me, I'm going to get a shot in because, you know, you, you got to protect yourself at all times. And then they, you know, of course they had the TKO and got it over with. But um, like I said, when you look at that body work, 71-3, to three, the second half of the fight, that body work was pretty intense. And he just he just outclassed him, 193-86, to 86, outworked him, out, out, out everything, basically. Looked, you know, even way better, I'd say, than the last couple of times I've seen him. And uh, it really makes me want to see the Williams fight now. Like, that was a really good match, and we could see – where Aleem was even more than just an eye test and some of the guys he's beat. Um, but hey, this you know was eliminator. Aleem's a damn good fighter, man. I was very impressed with him. He looked pretty good. I do want to see, you know, how he looks. I thought that, like I said, I thought that Tremaine Williams was that was a good matchup for him. It's too bad that fight fell through because we did, um you know, get a one-sided fight at the end of the day, although, like I said, the first chunk of rounds. A lot of these fights kind of turned out somewhat similar, maybe not the ending, of course, but um, um, Angelo Leo and Tremaine Williams was in the main event. As I mentioned, Williams came up um, from the co-feature. You know, on the surface, Southpaw, different look, um, a different look for Leo that he was going to fight anyway, has that defensive posturing and, you know, he counters, he's got good hand speed. He's pretty slick. Um, I was wondering if he was going to stay in the pocket more or be on the move more. And it felt like when he was on the move early, he did better. Um, the first couple rounds were very competitive. I actually gave him the first round. Uh, the several left hands in a competitive in spots anyway round. I actually gave him that one. Um, close round in, in the second, uh, you can start to see Leo finding a home for his jabs. Um, and then once the third and fourth kicked in, once he got, he established his jab, uh, then he, of course, he, you know, he brought the fight inside. Um, especially like the the fourth, fifth, and sixth right there. He's landing the better shots, starting to go to the body, like I mentioned. Um, he kind of would work the body and then occasionally have like a short hook to the head. Um, just good back and forth in the mid-rounds at times, but it was mostly Leo getting the better of everything, outworking him, punches and bunches. I, I really enjoyed what I saw out of Leo. I actually tweeted it that it was a sturdy performance, and I think that kind of fits the bill. Just a good, fundamentally hard-nosed, but yet smart in there, um, taking the fight to him, cutting the ring off. Like I said, taking that fight all the way inside. Um, he looked damn good, man. He looked really, really good. And it kind of makes me excited now because I've seen Fulton even a couple more times than Leo. I've seen Leo, I think, three times before this fight. Um, it does sound like Stephen Fulton's going to be next. I think they got the WBO uh, approval on that. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure. So I uh, I enjoyed what I saw. I, I really did. I, I, 
it was, a, like I said, a sturdy performance. Really showed me a lot. The cards read 117, 111, 2, 118, 112. I had it about that, 10 to 2, 9 to 3 tops. Um, like I said, early round in, early couple rounds for Williams, he looked pretty good. But uh, other than that, that was a wrap. And, uh, but it was an exciting fight still. I'll give Williams some credit. I mean, he threw 700 punches, so he still was in there, both of them over 700, uh, 248 to 196, and 102 to 77 when it came to uh, the body work. So Williams did a, a pretty decent job with the body, but the power punches, and it's not like Leo wasn't landing a jab or throwing it, flicking it, but um, 228 to 152 on the power punches. So I, I was pretty impressed. Off of Leo, I thought this was close to a 50-50 fight. I actually did uh, pick Fulton by like eight to four, seven to five, something like that. Uh, but I, I, I'm really looking forward to this fight. I was already looking forward to the fight, <laughs> but now I, I it just kind of stepped it up a little bit more. Um, so all in all, uh, as far as the broadcast goes, I'm not going to get too picky in this. You can go one way with the more basic thing, uh, the more bare bones setup. Uh, I bet their walk-in stage is okay. Um, you know, maybe the top rank looked a little better or something, but I'm not worried about all that shit. You could actually go the opposite way with Eddie Hearn and have fireworks and all that, and that's cool too, however you want it. To me, it's really about what's going on in the ring. I did like how they might um, – the punches, you can really hear, I mean, just the walloping sounds of Leo's punches. I did like that part. Um, it was kind of an adjustment, unless it's like, uh, what's his, what's his toes? Uh, uh, I can't think of his name right now. Um, the whisper, you know, the, the boxing whisper. Is it Virgil? Um, most people just will sit there. And yell at a guy, right? But there are some people who who whisper a lot. You know what I mean? And you know when I'm I'm talking about the corner, of course. And uh, it was a little adjustment to hear guys talk like this. Hey, but we have to do this. We have to. You know, they, I mean, that was pretty funny. Virgil Hunter is who I was thinking. Of. And uh, <laughs> thanks for texting me. Um, that was kind of funny. Do and they obviously are whispering because they, you know, if you even talk normal, you can hear what he's going to tell his fighter to do. So it made sense. Just it was an adjustment that I was like, oh wow, that's weird. But I did also like, and I saw many people say this on Twitter, a couple of different podcasts mentioned this too. I really like, oops, I really like um, the uh, shoot. Oh man. Something's up with my mic. Sorry about this. Hold on. Oh, I see. The cord is twisted. Okay, I'm not going to mess with it. I think it'll be okay. Yeah, I think it'll be okay. Um, What was I saying, though? I just I just completely lost what I was saying. No, but the, the quiet, I was talking about the quiet talk, right? That does make sense, though. Of course you got a quiet talk. It just, it just threw me off a little to whisper in the corner and stuff. I totally lost, lost my train of thought. Um, but anyway, um, that about wraps it up. If you look at the uh, the television rating, it, it lines up with about what Top Rank did based off their numbers. Uh, top Rank got about half. I don't know their average for the whole series, um, but just looking at the series, there were a couple, the Stevenson – and a couple other ones, I think two other ones that peaked pretty well on ESPN, but a lot of that had to do with the peak happening at the beginning of the broadcast because of their lead-in, like a UFC lead-in type thing. Um, but if you look at the averages of what they were getting, it basically lines up. Usually Showtime's in that three hundred to 400,000 range. And so where they were didn't really shock me, uh, especially now having to compete with the NBA during in August, which in July and August, you're not competing with the N NBA. But I, I actually, you know, I, this doesn't surprise me. Dog days of summer, 
Um, I think I think all these uh, platforms are just going to have to build it back up, and people have to get back used to doing it. And let's be honest, Stevenson, uh, Oscar Valdez, um, there 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 wasn't a lot of you know really popular names on top rank, so that plays into it. Just like a lot of folks don't necessarily know the fighters yet, a lot of them were in their first Showtime Saturday night at a show box too but yeah it's not a big surprise like i said this fall this fall is going to be strange because it's about building back right so there's going to be some good ratings no doubt but it's also the the level of competition with the nba and the mlb i mean that's always there anyway but the nba is usually not popping off in, in august you know and then ramping up in september and october you know, so that this is going to be strange, no doubt. Um, but it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, let's move to Ted Cheeseman and Sam Eggington uh, on the zone slash Sky Sports for the UK fans. What's up, UK fight fans? Um, Egg and Cheese. I actually did think that Egg- Eggington. I thought Eggington was going to win the fight, like pull it off. Not when I'm watching it live, but prior. And I don't know, man. Like, it, it, I, I can just all across the board sometimes. You don't really know what performance you're going to get out of him. And that's not taking anything away from Cheeseman because he uh, fought a really good fight. I've probably seen Cheeseman a handful of times. I've seen Eggington probably five or six fights over the years, something like that. This was a good mid-level matchup. That's what I liked about it. Um, you know, like coming up this weekend to Lorme and Jamal James. Now, if you, you know, compare weight classes, 54 to 47, you know, both of them are stacked, right? Especially on the PBC side. But I, you know, Cheeseman and Eggington are probably a little lower than Delorme and, and, uh, James, but you get, you get my feel for it basically. And, uh, it was just a good, a, a very good match, equally match fight on paper that turned out to be a little bit better than I thought. Now, I don't think it was the fight of the year, you know, but it was a damn good competitive fight. Um, the Cheeseman just got the big cheese, as they call him there in the UK. Ted Cheeseman just got off to a better start. The first three rounds, I gave them all to him. Um, he, he kept landing this, uh, short right uppercut along with his jab. He was really pumping his jab. I thought he did a good job of being busy, but also kind of resetting on the outside. Um, at times he was attacking, but like I said, he kind of circled his opponent and, and kind of reset. Um, Eggington started to get his jab going as well. He was moving a lot more on the outside, um, Landed a couple of nice right hands as well, kind of early on in the fight. Um, but that was the second round, that right hand that nearly dropped him. And uh, by Cheeseman, nearly dropped Eggington, and he flurried late like that. Um, but once you got, maybe the, I mean, the fourth round was somewhat close, uh, but the head and body work still, to me, was better. Now, the fifth round from uh, Cheeseman. The fifth round is where the the fight kind of slowed down a little bit. It kind of took a little, you know, and maybe it was one of them just taking a break. You know what I mean? That that happens. It's, it's a twelve round fight. Um, it picked back up though, and then the last three rounds were really really fun. Now Eggington made a run. I gave him the sixth and the seventh. Um, he closed really well in those those rounds as well to kind of finish it off. Uh, The short hooks and uppercuts on the inside was pretty good. I thought the seventh round was his best round since probably the first in the start of the second because he actually looked good in that second round until he got uh, lit up. And then you saw Cheeseman, his nose looked, you know, like it was bleeding pretty well. I don't know if it was broken or whatever, but it was bleeding pretty well. And so you thought, okay, well, Eggington's put a couple of rounds together. Maybe he can pull this thing off. I did give Cheeseman the eighth, though, to kind of calm that down, and that's kind of when he was doing that circle reset thing. Um, He just landed the better shots, basically. 
back and forth, very close ninth round. That one was up for grabs, in my opinion. Another entertaining tenth round, though. Um, better shots, I thought, by Cheeseman. Um, just fun two-way stuff all the way down the stretch. Eleventh round was fun. Lead right hands um, by Cheeseman uh, early on and uh, in the twelfth. And then with 70 seconds left, he buzzed Cheeseman, did, did uh, Eggington. But Cheeseman rallied back and possibly – Buzz Eggington. It was kind of interesting that way, and it was that that kind of sums up the fight back and forth. Good stuff. Like I said, very fun, entertaining fight to watch. Um, and that's why I talk about mid-level fight on the show so much because, you know, when you're moving a prospect, you never know what you're going to get it for being honest. You know what I mean? You, you never know as far as matchup. Matter, you know, every fighter is is, you know, matched differently, even the different outfits out there, right? That they match up their fighters differently, take a little slower, take a little longer. Some guys just need to take some more time, like I mentioned. So um, you never know what you're going to get, although I love a good test, you know, from a fighter, obviously, that that's stepping up or whatever. And I think PBC has a couple of these fights on their, on their undercards coming up for showtime. But, um, and, of course, number one against two or top five against top five and the big super fights that, you know, happened Wilder Fury earlier this year and all that. I love all those fights, of course. But if boxing, which I think in the last few years, especially maybe the last three to five years, I think boxing's gotten better at the mid-level fight. And maybe I shouldn't say better. They're just more broadcast on television. You know, for, for a while, the last – chunk of years on Friday night fights. Sometimes we get some really good mid-level fights or contender level fights or even a championship fight and stuff like that. But a lot of times it was showcases. A lot of times it was literally, like I said, a showcase to show the public, you know, like, hey, here's my guy. I'm trying to get him to HBO or Showtime, you know what I mean? So it wasn't like they invested in a bunch of guys. And when they did, you can see like Gamboa was developed on the there was some fighters that were kind of would come back to the network, but um, the mid-level fight, dude, you know, that is where it's at. The mid-level fight. And the fact that we, we do have probably way too much boxing as far as cards go, you know, if we're being honest, maybe not for the hardcore fight fans, but you know, in general, we have so many, if you look at how many cards a year, the PBC top rank to zone, there is a ton of cards. So, you know, I'm not saying that it's all been good mid-level fights, but I've seen that uptick, and I think that's that's a key in boxing, man, because a lot of times, like, for instance, the Lorme and James, that's just a good competitive fight that you could make it, you know, an argument for both guys, clearly. The odds tell us it's a close fight. Like, to me, that's what I think boxing needs to continue to get better at um because like i said a lot of people oh you know they'll, they'll, some of these fox matchups or even on espn or whatever uh they'll just be like ah oh, you know to me that being a fox main event kind of sucks dude you need bigger names and it's like okay first of all bigger names are more expensive right and, and second of all casuals don't know many fighters so they don't know who the what's what anyway so are they going to be like, oh, I don't know these guys, so I'm I'm not going to watch it? No. They're going to be like, if the first couple of rounds are competitive, they're going to be like, oh, dude, this is a fun fight. You know, now I'm not saying like channel surfing that a matchup with Spence on Fox wouldn't draw more eyes. I'm not saying that, like, or, or stay on the channel. But once you're watching a fight, you know, these people don't know the fighters. So why not put this fight like – like right now, it's it's plus one sixty for Delorme and one eighty five minus one eighty five. That's pretty damn close to a fifty fifty fight. Um, so you know it is what it is. There's really no, let's see, there's really no other. What else is, yeah, well, on this website, the seventh and eighth, there's really not that many. Uh, 
you know, fights that are that closely uh, matched. Um, so, anyway, uh, as far as, uh, well, we did have, what did we have? Um, oh, James uh, Tennyson. James Tennyson took on, uh, was it Gwyn? I think it was Gwyn. He actually put up a decent fight considering. Uh, but Tennyson, he was just a guy that's going to come at you. You know, he's going to walk you down. He was landing short and good punches. Um, I gave him the first, like, three. He kind of – he was kind of trying to get in with this high guard and just try to force himself on the inside. And I, and I thought that he did that well early, but then after that, it seemed like he was like, whatever, I'm just going to try to knock this guy out. Especially, like, in the fourth, both guys landing, you know, very well, good exchanges and whatnot. Um Gwyn was landing hooks to the body, I thought, pretty well. But you could see by round five, you know, Tennyson was wearing down Gwyn, and uh, he was just uh, just busier, you know. Um, or, well, I don't know, maybe not busier, busy, like just landing the better shots, because Gwyn was plenty busy. Um, but I think it was the, was the seventh round where that was stopped. Um, an overhand right knocked him down. Tennyson landed uh, an overhand right, and then there was like a uh, just a flurry, you know, just a flurry in exchanges and whatnot in, in, in a TKO. So sturdy performance as well, not to use that word twice for a performance. But it was a fun little fight while it lasted. Um, I'm trying to think of that prospect that was on there that knocked some dude out. I, I just lost his name for some reason. I can't remember what his name was, but um, I want to say it starts with a C. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember his damn name, though. But anyway, uh, as far as, like, the look, you know, obviously, Eddie spent a bunch of money for this thing to look good, you know? And that's cool. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm more worried about what's going on in the ring, but I'm also not going to sit there and be like, oh, you know, Eddie's stupid to do this or stupid to do that, because that's, that's fun, too. I mean, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to, you know, have a crowd there. Or not a crowd, but because there was no – have some excitement because of, there wasn't a crowd. And, you know, the fireworks and the flames and all that, some people say, oh, that's a little overdone. I mean, sure, you can say that, but, you know, it is what it is. I personally don't – it doesn't make the fights better for me, um, but it was Dalton Smith is who I was thinking about. That just came to my head. He uh, he took care of, oh boy, like, what was it, the fifth round knockout or something like that? Um, and it was, wasn't it like a jab or something like that? It really wasn't that uh, that big of a shot, it didn't look like, but he, he's looking like a pretty decent prospect, we'll see. Um you know, where he goes, and Rung Vasai came back, didn't really look good, uh, got off to, like, a, a slow start, you know, and, um, but he picked it up, and uh, ended up doing his thing, and, and winning the fight, so that's really all, and didn't get, like, a really bad cut or anything like that, so hopefully they can, uh, you know, hopefully they can give us uh, a big fight with him. In general, Rung Vasai, Estrada, or whatever. We've heard Chocolatita win a Estrada. That doesn't seem like that's going to happen. Um, Chocolatita wants a lot of money. And I'm not ripping him for it, you know. But it, it just doesn't seem like it's going to line up. Yeah, you know, it kind of seems like this Lomachenko and, and Lopez fight right now that it's not going to necessarily line up. I don't know. I will be getting into news. Um, here in a little bit, whether it's Gary Russell Jr. calling out everybody, which has become every couple of weeks that he does that. But he started bringing up Crawford like he was going to go jump from 26 to 47 against arguably the best fighter in the division. I mean, and that's a big argument, but, you know, whatever, top two or whatever. I mean, or top three, whatever. Uh, Pacquiao spent in him, but I don't know. There's just certain – things that are just making me laugh about this. We'll talk about that Loma and Lopez fight. Talk about Oscar. Talk about Pauly. We gotta talk about Pauly. 
I'm not going to go way in depth in that because like a month ago I did, and I don't want to continue to give you the same segments, uh, that type of thing. You know, if I have, I have something new to add to it. And a lot of it has to do with the fan reaction of what they were focusing on, what Paulie said. A lot of people are just focused on the Eastern European thing and all that, and they totally like, I don't know. It is a freedom of speech thing, no doubt, and I'm all for freedom of speech. But we all know, you know, like for instance, when I, you know, when I got a job, well, I switched places to a new job. I have to sign a contract about social media and about certain things. Like I can't go out actually and dog my restaurant on social media. Not if I plan to stay hired. And I'm not saying he did that. I'm just giving you examples. And I don't work for a conglomerate. And people say, oh, Showtime's not. Yeah, but Showtime, CBS owns Showtime. So I don't work for some major corporation. I've worked for some pretty big corporations in the past. But you got to put it all in perspective, and you got to you got to know what we're talking about in a variety of ways. Um, and, and that's what I guess it didn't throw me off because there are a lot of ignorant people there, but are out there. But you know, most of the stuff he was talking about was just fine when it came to what Haney said and his thoughts on Eastern European and and bringing up the you know the history of boxing and. Jewish fighters and then Irish fighters and Italians and black fighters and, you know, all this stuff, but they just missed the point of what he actually said that was ignorant as shit, especially when he's broadcasting fights with a lot of black and Hispanic fighters. And that's what I don't understand why people don't zero in on that fact. Like he said, some ignorant shit that could be looked at as, well, dude, if you think that, I don't know what to tell you. You know, there's ignorance and there's racism. And sometimes it can be in the middle. Sometimes it can just be like, hey, I didn't know that's my bad. But if you're going to say what you're going to say about oppression in our country and not learn anything about it enough to know, to be informed, and you're going to stay steady in something – You know, that's where it starts to teeter-totter. Do you just don't know? A lot of people don't like that word ignorant. You're just ignorant. It's just people don't like it, you know? I think it's a better way to say than you're just stupid or you're dumb or something like that. But, you know, it is what it is. Anyway, um, but let's get to this uh, this weekend, okay? So there is – isn't the first British – I believe it's the first all-British women's title fight, if I remember correctly. Let me actually double-check that fact. I'm pretty sure I wrote it down someplace. Um, and that's Friday night on the zone here in the States and, of course, uh, you know, on Sky Sports um, in the U.K. Um, I'm pretty sure that that is – by the way, Rung Vasai won 97, 94, 96, 93, and 99, 91. I, the scorecards were just all over the place in that fight. Weird. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Oh, here it is. Yeah, so here we go. It says the first ever all-British women's world title is live on Sky Sports in Mix. What's Mix? Help me out, UK fans. What's Mix? Is that some sort of app over there or some sort of something? I don't, I don't I'm, I'm lost. I'll just admit it. I really don't know. Uh, but Terry Harper and Natasha jo- Jonas, 10-round uh, WBC Junior Lightweight World title. Um, the, on the undercard, um, let's see, Fowler is back. Hopi Price. I actually heard people talking about him the other day or her the other day. I uh, know it's him. Um, and then Smith and Thorley as well. I'm not too familiar with that. The rest of that card besides, uh, Fowler and whatnot. Um, so, but I'll, I'll definitely be listening or paying attention to listening. <laughs> um, so that comes in a couple of days. Remember that's Friday. So we don't have, not that it would go head to head UK, but we don't have, uh, 
just a bundle of stuff on one day, um, which always kind of sucks when the U.S. You know, platforms do it. Um, clearly, Terry Harper is a favorite. Um, I'm looking at the odds right now. Uh, minus 800. So plus 550 for Natasha Jonas. So um, we'll see how that turns out. Um, okay, that's interesting. So someone just texted me from the UK saying that Harper may have some sort of injury that she's hiding. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't have anything to confirm that 100%. Not to say that's a lying, but don't quote me on that 100%. But that could make things a little bit more interesting. But I don't I don't know that to be a fact. So so just putting that out there. Um, then on uh, Friday. I'm actually uh, heading out of town to watch um, this card and hang out for the next couple of days. Uh, not now, but on Saturday um, to go hang out with some family because my nephews um, are, are pretty into boxing, especially one of them. And we're going to watch this fight because, you know, it's a hometown kid, Jamal James out of Minneapolis. This was supposed to be August 11th. Um, and that, Armory was going to be jam-packed, loud as hell like it normally is. They had, you know, only a chunk of tickets left. And that was like, with three weeks to go or something like that, this fight is a good fight. Like I said, it's a, I'm not trying to, like, hype it up like, it's two top five welterweights going head-to-head on Fox, you know. I'm not saying that. I'm just more high. Well, I went I went to you on the middle mid level competitive on paper fights that I appreciate as a boxing fan, no matter what style. To be honest with you, um, but it means something because it's a hometown kid. But anyway, Jamal James, uh, Tomas Delorme, a uh, fight for a vacant, you know, WBA special. Speaking of the WBA special, I just take out any kind of stuff like this, and I. I mean, don't get me wrong. The WBC has the gold belt, the platinum belt, the silver belt, the whatever belts, too. It is what it is. No one really takes these belts seriously. But David Morrell against Lennox Allen. Uh, Morrell is a, is a guy from Cuba, right? He, he actually has transported his whole shit up here now in Minneapolis. Um, his, his family – oh, I'm sorry. His, I'm having all sorts of – his family um, knows uh, Tony Oliva. Uh, I don't know the exact connection when they met and whatnot. And I believe Jamal James and him um, competed. Like I think Jamal James was at a tournament or something like that. I don't know the exact details, but um, or I know him. I just can't freaking remember that part. But anyway, um, David Morrell basically. Uh, like I said, from Cuba, and he's now going to be based in Minneapolis. He's not just going to fight out of the armory, obviously, but um, they're high on this kid. And I guess they made this decision because, like I said, they do didn't, they knew Jamal James a little bit, but Oliva, he still lives up here. He, he was like a fan favorite back in the day. You see him, at, you know, out and about or at a Twins game, and everybody's like, hey, Mr. Oliva and Tony, and, you know, Everybody loves the guy, so I think that they saw his success and him being able to adapt, especially climate, up north, you know what I mean? I, I guess it just, it, the way they explained it to me that, you know, it really gave uh, the family confidence and him confidence of, hey, you know, I, I see that as something I can do. So now he's going to be based out of Minneapolis, which obviously I'm super happy about. And Truex has a fight coming up, but we all know Caleb Truex is, a little, you know, he's he's in the, the, the not in his prime part of his career. He's fighting Angulo, another guy that's even further out of his prime. But he put up a good performance against Quillen. So we'll see how that fight works out. But my point is, it would be nice because you figure Jamal James got a chunk of years left to fight in the armory. Obviously, I'm talking from a selfish point of view. Um, but if they could get Dave Morrell on some of these undercards, He's going to pick up steam here real quick, especially fighting on a, a Jamal James uh, undercard. And that's why it was going to be cool that that was going to be here and so many people were going to go. It was going to be fun. But, you know, it's COVID. It is what it is. So the matchup, though, 
Lennox Allen does actually have some skill, has a little bit of pedigree. He had a good trainer. Um, He was in a camp also with uh, some other good fighters. So he's, you know, I remember with him, with uh, Nazim Richardson, actually, too. I don't know. I think that was in recent. But, um, by the way, RIP to uh, Brother Nazim, Nazim Richardson. Um, For your third fight ever as a pro, as far as a full-on professional, I mean, I do think that he has some fights that would be uh, considered professional fights. I believe he was in that World Boxing Series, if I remember correctly. But anyway, he was like 123 and three, or 123 and two, or something. The amateurs. He lost to uh, the gold medalist uh, from Cuba. I think he lost to some dude from Canada too. I can't remember, but that was as an amateur. So in your third fight, this is a good opponent. The guy has like 23 fights. What is he? 22 and 0 in, in one draw. He, you know, it's not like it's uh, – it may not even – you never know. It may not actually look like a huge uh, step up when the fight's done, but it's got me intrigued. I mean, they're trying to move him, and I'm not trying to call him Lomachenko, but they're trying to move him like that. You know what I mean? Like, okay, third fight, you're going to actually get stepped up. Like Usyk and Gambo or, or Rigo as well got moved pretty fast. And so they are moving him pretty fast. Um, this guy has fought Brinson, I believe I said, was that a showbox fight, him and Brinson, a while back, um, Derek, oh yeah, Derek Webster was his last fight, I remember, I actually saw, I don't know if I saw that whole fight, but, um, you know, well, we're gonna find out, I think they're just kind of throwing him in there, like, let's see, let's see what you got, kid, and, and like I said, I'm not really worried about, um, the, the trinket strap that's on there. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not worried about all that. I, I, it is what it is. I'm not going to be like, oh, this dude, you know, is the best fighter because he's got a title at this, you know, weight or at this, you know, part of his career, third fight. I'm not worried about that. But I do think it's a really good fight for a prospect. Uh, I mean, it's, it could be a 12-round fight. So just that alone is like, okay, dude, let's see. Um, Omar Juarez and Willie Shaw. I think Omar is going to win that fight, but Willie Shaw is a good test for him. Uh, and also, they're doing a little bit different. Instead of doing prelims, they're actually going to do post limbs. So they're going to do a post show. So they're going to run their card on Fox like normal, and then they're going to switch it to FS1 for the rest of the fight, which kind of makes sense. Um, Vito Mechanel, what is it, Milanecki? Melaneski, actually, I think is how you say it. Uh, Luis Pene, the the heavyweight. Uh, Mikel Fox and Lucas Santa Mar- Santa Maria, Santa Maria. That actually might be a good test too. That's a ten rounder. I think that's going to be what would be considered the main event. So there's an eight rounder, six rounder, and a ten rounder on the FS card after. Um, but as far as Jamal James and Delorme, to me. This is going to be a tough fight for Jamal. And it is, I just fully admit, excuse me, I just fully admit that I, uh, I'm cheering for him. I usually use the line of, I love boxing, and that I cheer for boxing. You know, I'll, I'll pick fighters, but I don't, I, I don't, you know, I, I'm more of, I don't really fanboy on a bench of fighters. You know what I mean? Um, there are some fighters that I just really like and enjoy to watch, you know, um, but I got to admit I'm a little biased or more, more than a little biased. It's kind of interesting because both of them, their last loss, because there's been some draws, but their last loss, both of them was Ugas. And Ugas has made a nice little run uh, the last chunk of years. Um, fighting on short notice and then slowly but surely kind of working his way up. But yeah, it was uh, right around actually. It was it was a summer. God, was it 2016? The summer of 2016 when Ugas beat uh, James pretty cleanly, and James kind of built himself back. Um, 
Chavez was a fight that some people thought he was going to lose. Abel Ramos was a very close decision. Um, Antonio DeMarco last summer was a pretty damn good fight. I thought he won cleanly, but it was, it was, I think it was a 10 rounder, right? I think it was, I think it was 10. I had it like six to four, seven to three or something like that. I think it was six to four, but that was a good little brawl. That's the problem. Like, Jamal, even though he's 6'2", and he's got length and everything like that, he's 6'2", but he, do, he doesn't have, like, 74-inch reach or something like that. You know what I mean? He kind of – the reach actually is in favor of the shorter guy, 5'10", DeLorme. Um, and DeLorme, like I said, uh, lost to Ugas in 2017. But then he did have a very competitive fight a couple of years, maybe a year and a half back with Jesse Vargas. And I remember him beating uh, that prospect, Terrell Williams, who was undefeated, probably like like 17-0 and 0 or 20-0 and 0 or something like that. Um, his first loss was way back, probably like 2010 or something, against Aubrey Gu. Um, I remember that. Uh, let's see. He beat Mayfield. Uh, beat Lundy, split decision a while back. He got knocked out TKO against um, Crawford, but, you know, that was actually around the time. I think that was 140. That was around the time when Crawford was getting hit early in fights. He was still knocking people out, but he was getting hit, like, somewhat early in fights. Obviously, Gamboa had a ton of success, but even like Beltron, when, when Crawford was going for the knockout late, Beltron hurt him. And um, so he had success against Crawford, but, you know, I try to limit it because it wasn't like a ton of success because he got knocked out early, uh, not in the second round, but what was it, like the fourth or fifth or something like that. Um, the Ugas fight, he knocked down Ugas. That was a really good fight. That was very competitive. Um, this is a barn burner to me. Stylistically, these guys have skills, but they usually end up kind of leaving themselves open and going for it, going to try to hurt people, get the good fight, back and forth fight. Um, I will be interested to see, though, and this is for the vacant WBO special, whatever it is, but it does put you in line for bigger fights. Ugas has got a fight with Ramos actually coming up. I think it's going to be on that Fox card or a Fox card, maybe FS1 card, um, which that'll be interesting because that'll put him in uh, better contention for a bigger fight. In fact, this is actually – sometimes you can put two and two together and it equals four. Sometimes it doesn't equal up and you're like, oh, I thought I thought that was the, what they are doing, but – Let's put it this way. They may mention this. They may have Thurman because they're going to announce the uh, the Fox schedule. The Fox and the FS1 schedule. They're going to announce it on Saturday. And the way they make it sound is there's going to be five or six Foxes for the rest of the year. Because there's going to be another one in August in a couple of weeks, I think, with Porter is going to stay busy. And then FS1, I believe Caleb Truax and Angulo is going to be. I think that's the 29th, but there's no official word on that one. But that's that's what I'm hearing and seeing. Some other people back that up. So um, we'll see. Truax and Angulo, which they're both kind of veteran guys. And that It is what it is. But they're talking about announcing a bunch of FS1 cards. And I've heard up to 12 cards. Now, I don't know if they'll just put them all out right now. That would be – that'd be crazy if they – that would be like 18 cards maybe. Like six or maybe five. And it would be like 16 or 18 cards maybe. So I don't know if they're going to announce all 12 FS1 cards. I'd be impressed, but I, I'm still like, wow, that seems like a lot to to announce five Fox shows or whatever it's going to be. And then 12, it just seems like a lot. Like I said, as a fan, it's nice to know what the fights are coming. But I, I don't really know exactly what's going to happen there. Um, so, man, this is a tough one for me. Because like I said, I'm usually not, 
I may be biased to like when it's top guy against top guy, the guy that has a different game plan that has a game, you know, has a plan B plan C yada, 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 that can plan be on the outside, inside, whatever. Right. I usually go with that. That's what I'm biased to um, when it comes to a, a certain fight or whatever. Not always though. I've picked the come forward fighter plenty of times too, but um, as far as like wanting someone to win, I am, I got to admit that I want Jamal James to win, obviously. But this is going to be a tough fight. And Jamal needs to not just use his jab and all that, but he really needs to pivot. He really needs to stay more on the outside because Delorme actually is kind of a, I'm not going to call him this big puncher, you know, but he's kind of a sneaky puncher. Like he can light you up and he's spotting better talent and show what he can hang, I'd say, a little bit more. I mean, Crawford, Ugas, you know, I mentioned a couple of these guys that he's already fought for so many. He's been around for so long. Now, is he a little bit more shop-worn? Yeah, probably, but he's coming off a really good performance. Um, Like I said, that unbeat prospect, and I thought he did really well against Vargas and Ugas. So, you know, the betting man, it's kind of one of these things um, <laughs> that you pick something and then you back it up. And I think plus 160, I don't know where that's going to go in the next couple of days, if it goes anywhere. But plus 160 is probably a pretty decent number uh, to put on DeLorme. Um, I see a lot of folks thinking DeLorme is actually going to win this. I'm not saying he's the favorite. It's a really close, you know, call. But I'll fully admit my, my pick is biased on this one. And I do want Jamal James to win. I'm actually going to pick him to win because I think he's going to see where he's at in his career and where it can go. What I was going to say, though, I, I just remember that. So I think the Lord, the winner of James DeLorme – as long as – I totally forgot I was saying this. Sometimes I just get lost. Sorry. If they, Let's say they, they're obviously going to announce a bunch of fights, right? So if, if Thurman is announced in a fight, well, then obviously he's not going to fight the winner. But I wouldn't be surprised if they say in December Keith Thurman returns and the winner of this fight faces because it puts him right back into the WBA. Because remember, he had a belt like this, the uh, interim, you know, not the real belt, regular, whatever the fuck, you know, WBA stuff. But he actually had this, and then he got bumped up to the higher thing of WBA, which obviously Manny has now because he beat him, uh, Thurman. So if they don't announce Thurman against somebody, obviously, I actually think the winner, Jamal James and Delorme, in December, I'm just guessing, because, um, you know, they, they need some time. And Thurman is still coming back from injury. They, you know, he's been training now, but whatever. So that's my guess. My two guesses are that Jamal James is going to win this fight, fighting the smartest fight he ever fought in his life, and win a very close uh, split decision, majority decision. But also, I'm just making a hunch call. I have no information at all i haven't gotten like because the armory guy doesn't even well when we talk but it's not really about jamal james right now normally i'd have exactly what jamal's being lined up for next but like i said sometimes you can you know use critical thinking use you know use just stuff that you see and go well maybe that's the point because we know thurman's gonna have an opponent, he's not going to come back. I, I guess he'll fight Pacquiao <laughs> if if he got the opportunity. It sounds like he would, but he's not going to come back and just be like, "I'm going to face the hardest dude right now." Um, he's not going to come back and fight, you know, Crawford or Portal. You know, I think he'll come back against an opponent um, that is contender level um, and not at the highest level. That's just a guess. So in a really close fight, and you know. I, I honestly, if these are if, if Jamal James wasn't from Minneapolis, I gotta admit I probably picked the Lorman because I just think 
there is a chance that Delorme is shot for him, like I mentioned, a little bit. Enough to where he can't do it for a full fight or whatever, but it's not like he's taken all these beatings either. And even, like I said, that Ugas fight, that was a close-ass fight. The Jesse Vargas fight, that was a really close fight. So, I don't know. I guess I just kind of talked my way out of uh, Jamal James winning, didn't I? But anyway, that's uh, that basically sums it up for the weekend. Um, we'll get into some of this new stuff in a short little bit here. Um, by the way, we're going to talk minorly about Terrence Crawford. Terrence Crawford, I guess, is going to be back in November. Now, you know, they were talking about two different dates. November 14th or the 21st, I'm pretty sure you can take that away because November 21st is going to be the Danny uh, Garcia-Spence fight. So I'm assuming they're not going to go head-to-head. But this is what Bob Arum said to boxing scene. If it can't be Manny Pacquiao for various reasons, then we'll match um, Crawford with somebody else. But we told Crawford to be ready by mid-November. Like I said, they... They kind of went with those dates, the, the 14th and 21st, I'm assuming 14th now. He said he has had discussions with potential investors who may pay a significant site fee to stage a fight in their country, but nothing is concrete yet. Um, so we'll, uh, you know, we'll keep you posted. Um, real quick. Well, let's just get to that since we're on the Crawford stuff. So Gary Russell Jr., which he does now a lot, especially this last year, year and a half. You know, he tells a story about everybody ducked him and everybody, this all sucks. And actually, not even that long ago, earlier this year, he said that I told Al to get me these fights. And if I can't get them, then I'm going to have to leave. Well, if you don't get a decent, another good fight, you might as well leave then. Why not go to top rank then or to zone? You know, you might as well, if it's, if it's, if all these fighters, if it's so bad that all these fighters are ducking you, whether that's Al Heyman's fight or not, or bold or not, it is what it is. I, you know, I like that he's talking shit now. I like that he has a different mentality. The problem is I just can't forget, and a lot of fight fans or, of course, anti-PBC fans will just side with Russell no matter what. It's like, well, dude... Hold on now, because he used to say he's okay with just fighting once a year. And he know he said, you know, I, keep, I pay attention to the mandatory system. And a lot of times, that's who he come back to fight, you know. And he, I know for a fact that he lost a potential big fight because he had to come back and do his mandatory, and he got hurt. And so there goes a potential big fight that could have been negotiated. I don't know if that's happened numerous times, but that's the problem. When you only fight once a year and then there's a big fight that comes up, you probably want to get a tune-up and those tune-ups a lot of the times were mandatory. So if you were okay fighting once a year for years, and, and I've always said that injury in the early and mid part of his career did affect him too. Let's not forget about that, but he's the one who set this standard, you know, now his last two fights, Jojo Diaz, and King Tug, those are quality opponents. That's nothing to complain about. Those are quality opponents. But if you're going to sit there and call out Tank and Leo right now, Santa Cruz and Tank are fighting each other. And that's the whole thing about people give Santa Cruz a lot of stick, and that's cool for the last couple, like his last three fights. You know, yeah, hell yeah. (laughs) I mean, I was calling him Mr. I Need a Big Fight Leo Santa Cruz, you know, because he did, but let's not lose track of who he's fought now over like a five-year period, two fights with Abner, two fights with Frampton, and now Tank, which most people don't think he's going to win, so what have you done, Gary Russell, in these last four to five years? You could have kept fighting twice a year and fight other people than if he was ducking you. So that's the problem I have. Like I said, I've been critical of Leo these last year and a half or whatever, but the guy beat, you know, he he beat some solid fighters, and he lost to Frampton, 
who won the fighter of the year that year, and then rematched him and actually showed more skills. So I don't know. It just to now keep calling out Tank and Leo, to me that's just pointless right now because they're fighting. So and he kept saying they all want easy fights, they all want easy fights. He just wants easy fights. Well it's like I mean you've had some pretty easy fights too. And like I said, this is not an easy fight. So anyway, he started telling other stories and he told a story about Crawford about basically punching Crawford in the mouth and you know, kind of made it sound like, oh no, dude, it was he stole on me and all that. And they went back and forth and back and forth. And basically, long story short, because I'm not going to play clips and all that. Long story short, he said he'd go up and fight him at that weight class, and that's that's where it's like, come on, Terry. Like you're not going to go up to fucking welterweight to fight him, dude. Like, it, it, but hey, he's talking shit. It's working. He is starting to get some support online for it. I'll give him that. Um, but, you know, he, he makes it sound like, I don't know, he's calling out Haiti. He's calling out a bunch of people. So I hope he gets a big fight. Like I said, I've really liked his last two opponents. No doubt about it. But I don't know, man. <laughs> like, I get, I, I don't know. I, Crawford's chin has been in question at times because of getting hurt by Gamboa, Beltron, some other moments early in, I guess, mid part of his career where he was getting hit early in fights. And that hasn't been the case in quite some time. Even a couple of years back against Postal, He lost, what, the first round and then pretty much won every round after that. Like I said, DeLorme hit him a couple of times with really flush shots, then got knocked out. Shit, even Hank Lundy hit him with some good shots and then get knocked out. So it's really what a fighter's trying to accomplish in the ring at times, too. And, and you know, he just got dropped in his last fight, uh, Crawford. So that has kind of been some talk about that's the only thing holding me back from calling him hands down the number one, well, the resume, too. The, the pound for pound guy right now. Um, and it's one of the only things holding me back from saying he'd for sure beat Spence. I like his versatility against Spence for sure, but we do need to see him against better opponents, uh, at welterweight anyway. But yeah, Gary Russell Jr. Um, Hey man, you know, closed mouth doesn't get fed. That's cool. But some of this stuff, it's like, all right, dude, whatever. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, Oscar De La Hoya. <laughs> He tweets out this, hey, by the way, Ryan Garcia kind of, he didn't announce the fight, but he said it's basically happened. It's on. Let's do it, right? And, uh, you know, freaking all of a sudden he's like, no, no, dude. It's not on. What are you talking about? Like, he, he basically, I don't know if he's going against his own fighter or if this is a message to Eddie or what, but there's just certain times where you're like, Oscar, what, you, what what's going on here? Like, why are you so worried about what's going on? <laughs> like, online, I should say. Why, why are you so worried about expressing yourself online in this way? To me, it just doesn't really line up to, to be this way. Like I said, Ryan Garcia would speak of him, you know, talking shit about him online, or Gomez too, but yet they wouldn't return his text. So he he texted or he tweeted that Garcia Campbell is not done, it's not done, and he also said quit fucking around. So does that mean Garcia? Stop fucking around and let's get this done. Does that mean Garcia or does that mean Eddie Hearn? Um, but right now the whole fucking around thing is kind of like, well, I mean, you know, you guys have been fucking around with Canelo. <laughs> You're like, come on, dude. It, it kind of feels like he may lose. Another Mexican Independence Weekend. I, I'm not saying that's the case, but you already, you know, you already have competition that 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 day or that night with Roy Jones and Tyson. That that can't be happy. You can't be happy about that. Um. Oh, by the way, Lyndon Ar- Arthur actually was on that. Uh, he was on that BT Sports, and he's trying to set up a fight with Yard to him. Yard. 
somebody reminding me of that. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But it's so on brand to be like, yeah, man, this fight's on. And then Oscar come behind him and say, no, it's not on. It's not on at all. It just, it just kind of, it kind of blows me away. Um, let's see. A couple more items, and then we'll get to some folks. If, if you do want to call, or call. If you do want to, you're on right now. You can't call in right now, actually, because it's in the archive time. Um, but if you do want to, like Portland, I see, or anybody else on there, actually, let me look here. Oh, yeah, we got some folks on here. D-style, anybody that, you know, that wants to add to anything or whatever, that's cool. If you're just listening, that's cool, too. Um, so let's talk about, okay, Lomachenko and Lopez. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this, because there's been a variety of things, you know, talked about with this fight, and we hear one thing, then we hear another thing, and right now it's coming down to money. According to the Athletic, um, it's 1.25, kind of like take it or leave it type thing for Teofimo Lopez. Um, you know, that that's that's what it is. That's what it is. And uh, you know, he, he talks. Aram talked about you know. A variety of things as far as like, uh, you know, we explained to him that there's no gate and all that. Um, what is it, 3.2 or 3.4 that uh, that Loma would be getting? <clears throat> I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what it is. Um, but I don't know, man. It's kind of all over the place. Dude. It, it, it really is. To me, it's all over the place because you have Bob, you know, going at it, saying all this stuff. I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know what, what, what's actually happening. You know what I mean? Um, because first he said, and it's been vague, and I'll, I'll read you a couple of these uh, items here. Whoops, I just accidentally closed that out. Whoops. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. Um, where is it? So they're, they're kind of far apart on the money right. 3.25 is exactly what he's getting um, for a contract guarantee. Lomachenko, it'd be 1.2, uh, like I mentioned. Um, you know, he in his co-made fight, he made 500000 um, a career-high payday at that time. Um, now, it's below market value right now, but it is what it is. Todd DeBuff talked about we're working on it. Uh, you know, that we started the conversation a while back and, and we're still working on it. It is kind of crazy, though, to still be working on it when it was going to be maybe, maybe, what is it, May 3rd, I think? To me, that's kind of like, really? So you guys are, shouldn't you guys already have this kind of figured out a little bit? Um, and that's what kind of threw me off, just a tad. It's just kind of like, Okay, um, why why isn't some of this already figured out? Why haven't you agreed already? You you were gonna maybe fight in May. It, it, it doesn't line up. I mean, if you look at Leo and Gervonta, they were gonna fight in June or July, and there was no issues there. So I, I don't know, but it's kind of vague because first of all, it was gonna be on pay per view, right? That's what they said pretty much from the start. Then lately. They, well, not somewhat lately, they pushed to October 3rd. And then all of a sudden, all these pay-per-views, you know, the the Tyson, the Charlo, the Leo, we assume in December, maybe Wilder Fury, November, Garcia Spence. So they're obviously not going to go a, a, a week after the Charlos. And not just that, but if you look at that, it'd be like in four weeks, it'd be Tyson and Jones, Charlo, you know, that that's tough. And then Canelo's fighting possibly in that time too. So they, a lot of times this is like who beats who to the dates. That's what a lot of this is around. Remember uh, uh, when Canelo and Triple G fought the first time, um, uh, McGregor and Mayweather fought a couple of weeks in August before that. And that kind of, you know, was a, was a, big debacle or debate or whatever, but this is about four or five days ago from Keith Eidick. And it's, it, it kind of, it's kind of all over the place. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm, I'm wondering. Cause 
that's what happens when you're talking to Bob Arum or reading his quotes and whatnot and seeing interviews. He's kind of all over the place. He says Lomachenko could air on ESPN, but it could be on pay-per-view. It could be on ESPN+. Plus. It's kind of all over the place. And now he's saying, well, we know it can't be on pay-per-view. But this is what he was saying before we knew about the other fight. So it's kind of, it's kind of weird. Um, he said it's a possibility of ESPN+. Plus. Um, like I said, on, on pay-per-view. But here, here's another thing. We, we're negotiating the purses with Teofimo. We're making progress, and hopefully we can get it agreed on. ESPN is going to do it. I don't know whether, you know, what it's going to be on. But he said it's an expensive fight. But if college football goes away instead of showing a big football game, say Michigan is, uh, against Ohio State, for example, if we do Loma and Lopez and put two total fights with it, that's a big pull event that could be a substitute for a big college football game on ESPN. So to me, it's like, well, so are you saying it could be on ESPN if the college football season doesn't, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, what? But then we've also heard that he's going to have six straight weeks starting on August 22nd on ESPN or ESPN Plus of fights. So it's like, well, I'm confused on Saturday night. So, I don't know. And he said the company could, you know, provide more if Major League went down, the Major League Baseball went down. So it's kind of all over the place. I'm, I'm just kind of confused because it's like, well, which, which one is it going to be, dude? You know what I mean? And he comes across like, well, fuck this guy. You know, basically, like, I gave him this. He can go back to making $300,000, um, you know, fighting his man down. And they even – we're talking, and, and he, you know, he goes on to say even more that, you know, basically, like I said, screw this guy. I'm, you know, if he doesn't want to take it, they said they'll take the mandatory. Then and it's like, what? what, what, what's going on? I, I'm lost. And he said, well, we t- we told him there's no live gate. We told him all this stuff, but he wants to make it a pay per view because he wants more money. It's like, well, you haven't told any of us actually what the fight's going to be on, and obviously he probably knows. But if the only way, it just doesn't really line up to me that the only way it could be on normal ESPN is saying, you know, like, well, if college football goes to shit, we could fit it in there. It's like, well, that's a if. And don't get me wrong, it's COVID, so it's not the craziest if, you know what I mean? But I just don't understand it, it just seems like, I don't know, we could talk money if we want. Obviously, should he get more? This would be double his biggest fight ever, uh, Teofimo. So that is saying something. You know, that is a lot, actually. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big fight. This might be the most fight, this might be the most money he makes in one fight in his whole career. We just don't know. So it... it I'm I'm in between on this one because he always says this can be easy. I'm gonna knock him out, and, and a lot of fans are like, "All right, dude. Well, if it's gonna be so easy, then just knock him out. Like, what's the problem? You know? Then just knock him out." And it's like, yeah, I mean, I hear you, but you know, money. You hear like dudes are getting a mill for not Lomachenko. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, in the zone, a lot of people blamed you know Al Heyman years back that he's messing up the market. And to an extent, that, that was true. He was messing up the market. But in the same breath, his model's different, too. I mean, top rank, you know, I remember him breaking down that Tyson Fury, you know, money situation. He said he got, you know, he gets 30% of that money uh, of what Tyson makes, Fury. So, you know, Al has a different model, especially the guys that don't aren't signed with promoters. Then it's a, a much different model. So, I don't know, man. He's talking out of both sides of his mouth. He's talking about, well, it may not be, uh, you know, uh, it may not be a a pay-per-view. And I told him it's not going to be a pay-per-view, so we don't have that. It's like, well, now he wants to make it a a pay-per-view fight. And it's like, well, really? Like, because you're telling us you don't know what it's going to be. So, okay, so let's say it's a pay-per-view fight. Well, if it was ever going to be a pay-per-view fight, why didn't you schedule this shit earlier? Because we, we were hearing 
that Lomachenko was holding out for more money, you know, a few, a chunk of weeks back. That was coming from, you know, from Teofimo, though, of course. So we got to keep that in mind. But I don't know, man. It just It's all over the place. Should he just take it and go for it? Yeah, let's do it. You know what I mean? Okay, I get it. But I don't know. Man. It, it's tough to say. What if he loses the fight and then he de- he never even gets back to that top level of money? I mean, who else do they have on the network to fight him? Not a ton of people. I mean, if he wants to go all the way up, yeah, then he does. But I don't know, man. I, I'm kind of in between on this because, like I said, he, he says, well, Devin Haney makes a mill of fight. All these – but, you know, it's all about what you negotiate. What you get is what you negotiate. And what he got prior to this is what he negotiated, 500000 or whatever. And, and he did say, well, that was, you know, that was basically his uh, – that's his career high, you know, and, and, and Bob's saying, you know, I don't want to lose money on this uh, just because he thinks he's worth more, you know. And, you know, so I, I get what Bob Arum's saying there, you know, but he, he goes on to say, I mean, we're willing to pay him a big price, but again, I'm not going to lose millions of dollars on the event because he thinks he's worth more. And uh, so I get that. Um, Mick Water, his uh, – is representative. Everybody's trying to do the right thing, but there doesn't seem to be enough money for everybody. We were willing to take a haircut from what was expected before, not one at the magnitude that's presented to us. I think, uh, I think more likely we'll take another fight and then revisit Lomachenko. To me, a lot of it has to do with ESPN. I mean, if they want the fight, then they should find a way to make it work for top rank. Bob's right. Top rank shouldn't take a, a loss of the money, but Either should Tiafino. So, it's all over the place right now. Should he take more money? Should he take less money? I understand this is the an ongoing issue now with fights. And a lot of it does have to do with some of this overpaying, major overpaying. I mean, Garcia just got, and I'm not trying to say Tiafimo and Mikey Garcia on the same level. I'm not saying that at all. Or even Jesse Vargas actually right now. Not saying skill, but people knowing them. Because, you know, he has fought a lot of people, Pacquiao and Bradley and you know. But you know, he got five or set Garcia got seven mil to fight um to fight uh Marcus. Didn't they say it was a ten million dollar fight? So that would be three to him. I thought he got a little less than that for Marcus. But anyway, you know, I don't know. To me it's like so which one is it? I don't I don't understand what you're saying. So it is on pay per view or not, and that's what kind of makes me want to hold off all the way on some of this stuff. You know what I mean? Because it's like, hmm. Okay, so you're saying you're saying one thing, but we don't really know that actually. We really don't know that for a fact. So I'm kind of in between on it. I got to admit. Um, because, you know, Bob says a lot. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see how this thing – I just hope they find a way to get it done. And, you know, the plan was actually to, to take stay busy fights. Bob Arum's plan for both of them was let's take stay busy fights and then re, revisit. Anyway, um, oh, was it World Boxing News? What website – put out an article and you can just tell people are hard up for hits that Spence is having mental issues because he was uh, running some like coyotes away from his cattle or something like that. You know what I mean? Like just cause he showed a gun and it's like, dog, he didn't have the gun to his head or like say, I'm going to come to your house and fuck somebody up or go Jermaine Taylor on a video. He was just, you know, doing his thing. He has a fucking ranch. He's from Texas, dude. You know, Americans, not just Texans, Americans like their guns. We're the most violent fucking, you know, country uh, in the uh, industrialized world. But, I mean, to sit there and say fans are worried about him. It's like, you mean the people on Twitter talking shit to him? Like, come on, dude. I guess so silly. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Crawford thing. Um, I'm sorry, not the Crawford thing, Paulie. 
So a lot of people, I've already kind of explained some of this, so I won't repeat it too much here. A lot of people are just focused on the Eastern European thing. You know, Pauli and many other people, especially for the last three to five years, I'm not saying Pauli, but Montero and a bunch of people have been talking about this Eastern European takeover, right? And I get it, you know. Lomachenko and Golovkin and Kovalev and, I mean, that's Russia, but whatever. Um, and I'm not trying to disrespect Ukraine and whatnot, saying whatever, that's Russia, you know. It's, it's in the realm, right? And so they, you know, Usyk, they have some guys in the top five, top ten that are just downright studs. They have some Uzbekistan fighters that are coming up, majorly MJ, a lot of, a lot of fighters, right? But is it a complete takeover? I don't know. The thing is, is the whole idea, a lot of people, for whatever reason, like I said, ignorance, racism, whatever, they were really honing in on his thoughts on the Eastern Europeans and how he talked about, well, it's, not, it's no longer the black fighter time. It's Eastern European time, right? Because they talk about Devin Haney and stuff. And the white boy comment, all that stuff. And, you know, Jewish fighters were, were the shit in like 1900 to 1920. Then you had, you know, Irish and Italians. Then the black fighters took over. It is what it is, right? A lot of stuff he was talking about, that's not what he got fired about. When you work for a large corporation and you go and say in the 2000s, so the last 20 years, there is no racial oppression. It's not that he's saying there's not racist people. It just doesn't affect a group of people. Systemic racism doesn't exist. And the way he says it, he says, well, if you want to get nitpicky and talk about George Floyd, this is not the time to say, oh, I mean, you can get nitpicky and talk about George Floyd. I mean, come on, dude. Like, I just listened to a podcast about uh, sugarcane farmers in the 2000s, in, the, in 2014, was one of this guy's worst year because his dad died. But they, got, they were getting fucked on seed loans. And, you know, there's just been, been a big civil rights thing with that. There was a, I'm not saying this exact case, but there was a, the biggest civil rights case payout ever. 16,000 farmers, a billion, you know, um, in, in payout. And some of this stuff goes way back, so we're not even talking about 2000s. But the individual story that the podcast was about was about the 2000s and 2010s, actually. So, and read a study about the job application. Similar resumes between black and white studies they do when they send out about a bunch of applications. They they send out the same stuff with the most stereotypical white and black names you can think of and where the stereotypical black people and white people live, right? Urban and suburbs, that type of thing. They send them out. White people get called back way more percentage-wise. They up the resume uh, to make it a better resume for the black person. It still comes back uh, not equal, fair. Um, From, you know, they send out thousands of these applications. Then they put a criminal charge on the white person's resume, and it's still the white person gets called back more. My point is to sit there and say this shit is ignorant as fuck anyway. And if you're in a power, you know, if you're in a position of power to an extent at any of these companies or not even that, we've seen people getting fired left and right for saying ignorant stuff. But when you're a broadcaster that broadcasts a lot of black fighters and a lot of Hispanic fighters, especially Mexican fighters, obviously, but Argentine all over the place, right? You don't think that that is not an ignorant statement? It's what you can have your personal opinions, but there are facts when it comes to this. And for him to say that, you know, basically racial oppression doesn't happen in the 2000s, and the way he even nonchalantly said, now before that, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, it was. So he's not even, I mean, yeah, sure, there was some before, but now there's none. Of course you're going to get fired for that because it's ignorant, and it can be seen as just straight race. Obviously, I mean, this isn't his first time, Espinosa said. He has been walking that edge for quite some time. On his podcast, he walked the edge 
a bunch of time and they never did anything about it. So I think it just added up to that's what you get, you know? So my biggest problem I had was so many people fixated on the wrong thing. It's like, so you don't see any ignorance in what he said. Well, that's his opinion. It's freedom of speech. He works for a big corporation, dude. That's the problem. Anyway, um, I'm going to go to my boxing Twitter segment now and some fight news and whatnot. If anyone wants to join in, that's cool. Oh, Chris Mannix. Um, Two things with Chris Mannix on Twitter. Uh, will we see a rematch between Joseph uh, Diaz and Tevin Farmer? Lou DiBella updates. Here's what JoJo said. JoJo Diaz Jr. He said, the money got to be right. Ain't nobody scared of that bump. Um, there has been a little bit of issue there <laughs> when it comes to that. Um, what else? Did he, oh, dude, I saw a tweet from him. Oh, the, here's here's uh, Lance Polenmeier. This is Fight News. Uh, Yoet Gonzalez against Mariaga, which is a good fight. And then Mean Machine against Ima. That's a good little card, September 12th. Kind of an interesting uh, time frame there uh, with, you know, how many how many fights are going to go on that night. It is what it is. But Mannix is actually, now that Pauly is out, Abner Mars, by the way, re- replaced him. I always liked Abner Mars. But now that uh, Paul, that's not a like I don't think he's officially taken over the spot like long term. I don't think they for sure mentioned that. I don't know. I'm happy with it, whatever. But look at Bannix, who's been anti PBC for a long time, and actually kind of didn't really speak highly of the Showtime schedule. This is what he tweeted after the card: strong refer, re- return for Showtime, competitive matchups, meaningful fight. Okay, meaningful fights, but yet you dog some of the schedule. Lots of challenges making big events with no crowd. Showtime off to a good start. To me, that tells me he's trying to kiss ass and get out of there. <laughs> I don't know. That maybe that just means that he doesn't look like that. By the way, um, Leo winning became the first Albuquerque uh, first male champion since Johnny Tapia. So that was kind of cool. Um UFC ran a card tonight where three different fights were called off because of positive COVID test and one more because a fighter fainted in the locker room. Another fighter who lost via arm bar then also fainted backstage and was taken to the hospital. Wow, that's a crazy tweet. Damn, that's crazy. So here's uh, somebody's opinion on uh, Teofimo. Under the circumstances, I think 1.2 mil is a fair purse for Teofimo. David Lemieux got 1.5 to put up his title against on the line against GGG after a string of spectacular wins against good contenders. Um, he had, Lemieux had proven more at this point. Um, I mean, the spectacular wins I totally disagree with. Spectacular wins. And by the way, didn't he just get his title and put it right into play? And that was another thing that this guy said on a different tweet. That, he, you know, he, he, his first defense. He just got the belt. He hasn't even made a bunch of defenses. Lemieux also lost twice via knockout, too. Um, so, yeah, there is something to, to, to say about that. Uh, here's Shakur Stevenson, Twitter segment here. Just because a fighter got more followers or a bigger following, that don't mean they the best fighter. Don't always believe the hype. Your favorite fighter can forward me. I'm true. I'm the truth. Okay, fuck with me. I don't know what he's saying there. Um, I'm the truth. The world gonna gon- take notice when the time comes. And that's cool. I, you know, that's, that's good. Um, Connor, oh, Connor McGregor hints at a fight. Someone just sent me this for Manny Pacquiao because he, he sent out a, I will accept in Philippines, in the Philippine language. So I, I, I don't know what the hell that means, but I, I guess that there might be something popping out. Oh, uh, Clarissa Shields, I don't know what y'all over say over 90% of the men boxers do not possess the skills that I have or my accomplishments and my accomplishments show that if I was a man in the sport, I'd be a billionaire. The fact is I'm being overlooked because I'm a woman is ridiculous. Now, hold on. 
you don't have 90%. Like, that means your top 10% of, of skills in boxing. I don't know about that. You had a damn good run, though. Two gold medals. A lot of, uh, you know, the depth in women's boxing is not necessarily up to par yet. I think it's going to improve, just like it did for UFC the last chunk of years. But to say you'd be a billionaire in the sport right now is just ludicrous. Just ludicrous. Just completely ludicrous. Unbelievably, like, dude, there's been one guy that revenue-wise went over a billion. One guy, and it took him how fucking long? I mean, it took him what? Like, from the time he won a belt, it took him like five or six years just to get on pay-per-view, let alone do all the damage. So that that's just, come on, dude. I don't know. I like Clarissa Shields in the ring, uh, you know, fighting, but to me, and I like what she's done, and I think she does get some shtick that's too far about her personality, about her. I understand some of the stuff, the the get him unk, you know, in that Darrell fight, that was fucked up. But she does do stuff for her community, no doubt. But, man, that is, to say you'd be a billionaire already is just fucking ridiculous. Because um, Errol Spence is pretty popular. You know what I mean? Wilder, Fury, they're, they're pretty popular. Joshua is pretty popular. You're out here talking about that you'd be a billionaire? What the fuck are you talking about? Okay, this is from the Glaze, the Glazier. Rumors are... Oh, this is May 14th, 220. Rumors around or abound. Errol Spence will return to the ring as soon as September. Back from a, you know, serious injury suffered in a horrible car crash that he said that he wasn't going to be able to fight again. That's what, you know, that's what Mr. I Want Clicks said, Glaze. Spence's opponent will surely be a no-name soft touch in typical, you know, a.k.a. Oh, wait. And typical cherry picking is what I see. Um, oh, mo- uh, I can't read. What did it say? In typical Heyman client modus operandi, a.k.a. cherry picking. And it's like, oh, really? Some dude said Spence versus Ocampa 2. It won't be Ocampo. It'll be something that level or worse. <laughs> this year, guy Glaze. This year, guy Glaze. And we know he's coming back. Um, Bob Arum came out and said that top rank or that Manny Pacquiao, you know, that, that Manny Pacquiao shit with, with, uh, Terrence Crawford is nowhere near a done deal like they're talking about. Um, so yeah. Uh, Clarissa Shields did say that she's ready to team up with Showtime and to be on some of these undercards. Uh, but she also named Spence Wilder and Pacquiao who actually aren't in the Showtime, but she did say the Charlo twins. That actually would be cool to put her on the other card. I actually think that could draw something um, like that. Uh, but, yeah, dude, that Clarissa Shields billionaire thing is just like, oh, really? Huh. Ask Paulie if the average fan knows the sacrifices he made to be a champ. He'll say no. Ask him why fighters go past their prime. He'll say only fighters understand. Now tell me why a guy whose main line of proof is based on his own experience feels comfortable speaking on other folks experience exactly that's a great tweet that is a great tweet that sums it up and you know it's kind of like people talking about being homeless well dude if you have a full-on being homeless then you know what the hell you're talking about you don't know what you're talking about um let's see low espn ratings boxing twitter top rate sucks low showtime ratings boxing twitter well they weren't big names when the stars come, they'll be back. Yeah, I mean, that's just PBC fanboys. Um, that's no surprise there. Um, all right, the show's about to come to an end here. Um, man, so DAZN is having problems with Canada. Like, not DAZN Canada, but boxing on DAZN. So now I know DAZN customer service tells me DAZN has disconnected match from boxing due to certain commercial sensitivities with rights. Translation, to Zone Canada won't pay match from boxing is asking. But I can watch darts, bowling, and fishing. That's what uh, Graham Houston is talking about in Canada. 
All right, guys. Enjoy the fights this weekend. Peace.